So right now, let's take you to Traverse City, Michigan, where I have the opportunity to host this special night with Yanni, as well as learn about music, creativity, and life. I got to tell you, this is a great pleasure for me, and it's a privilege to come to this school at Interlaken. I think it's one of the best schools for the arts in the whole world. I think that, yeah, go ahead. I absolutely love what they stand for and the spirit behind the school. And I know they work very hard to open young people's minds and I believe that an open mind is probably one of the most important qualities a human being could possess I wish when I was growing up that I could have come to school like this but I didn't have such an opportunity I grew up as you heard earlier in a in Greece in a little town called Kalamata right next to the ocean very beautiful but not a lot of opportunity there um, I had to learn music on my own because there was not, really, there was no tape recorder or turntable in the house. The only way I could hear music was through the radio and if I went to the movie theater. And if I wanted to hear back a piece of music that I enjoyed, the only way I could do it is by playing myself. And so that's how I developed perfect pitch. In case of some of you are wondering, I developed perfect pitch. I wasn't born with it, like some people like to think. I, I studied it. I tried to remember if there was a time where I couldn't really tell the notes apart from each other. So I know for sure now that I've developed it. It was around the age of seven or eight. And it started because I was going to the piano and I was tinkering with the notes, trying to repeat the song that I liked. Anyway, I didn't come here to lecture. I'm a very an orthodox composer, because I'm self-taught essentially. Um, I'm a believer that human beings are very powerful. All of us, not just some of us, all of us. And there is nothing that we cannot do. There are no limits. Only our imagination stops us. I just wanted to start talking with you. I want you all to relax. We can have some fun. You can ask me any questions you like. I will try the best I can to answer them. And my goal today is before the day is out, on your way home, hopefully you have heard something that has, will influence you in the, fu in the future. Something to get you to think about. Hopefully it will open your mind. Because I'm, I'm certain I will be coming in some, on some subject, I will be coming from a different angle that you're used to hearing. It doesn't mean it's the only truth, the absolute truth, and nothing but the truth. It is only what I have learned through experience and through trying really hard to understand music and composition and engineering and production and so on. Um, by the way, I taught myself how to play the piano, how to play the guitar, and I did have a few lessons. Uh, when I was seven, eight, nine year, years old, I took some lessons in playing the accordion. I gave it up, though, a um, few years later, and I will tell you why. My brother, which is, who is a year and a half older than me, was taking lessons on the piano at the time, and he, he became a pretty good pianist. And I noticed that well, while he was playing the piano, all the girls were going around him. <laughs> and when I wanted to show off and play my accordion, everybody left. <laughs> well, I'm not stupid. I got the hint. 
so I started playing the piano. <laughs> Last night when we were talking, Yanni mentioned that he really felt that there are a lot of potential Yannis out here, and I'd like to see the conversation pursue along those lines. I'll start the questioning, but I truly want all of you to engage in questions uh, with Yanni as well. So many people try to define your music, and I know we talked about how we all try to feel comfortable categorizing things. How do you define your music? Is it definable? I, I do not like definitions, I, as you might suspect. Um, music is music to me. The fact that I grew up in Greece, I think, uh, played a significant role in the way I, I look at music. I grew up listening to rhythms that are not common in the West. And what we call today in the United States ethnic music was what I considered music. And what here is rock and roll, to me that was foreign music. So I came upside down. When I moved to the United States, um, I started playing with rock and roll bands after I graduated from college to get experience in performing live and so on. And I also loved European classical music. I listened. And I listened a lot. And then listened some more. And this was the way I began to understand and get music in depth. I believed that if I was to sit and listen to Beethoven and Chopin and Mozart and Stravinsky repeatedly, these great men had put everything that they were about in their music. Because that's what music really is about. It's about one human being speaking. And they speak about what life feels like to them, about their experiences, about their life. It's not about showing off. It's not about, look, I've been practicing a lot. I can play really fast. It's about communication. Instead of using words, you use notes. Let's travel over to Chicago and to the person there who has a question. Do identify yourself and ask your question of Yanni. Hello. My name is Adam Smith. I'm eight years old. And my question is, what inspired you to Play the piano. Aside from the joke that I made earlier, uh, I love the piano. I love the, the, the ability it has to express so much. Um, it's not accidental or coincidental that a lot of composers like to use it. Nowadays, I don't really use the piano to write music. The way I compose is quietly. I don't tinker on the piano and accidentally stumble on a phrase that I kind of like and then make a song out of it. I do not like to manipulate or manufacture music. I think music should be allowed to flow through us. And so as you now are in school and you're learning about structure and you read books and you learn all where to put your fingers on the boards and on the strings and on the, on the piano keys and so on. All that is necessary. That is discipline. And you should spend as much time as you can to learn the tools. Those are tools which you use to speak. But when it's time to speak, you're not talking notes. You're talking emotions. You're talking about what you feel like. My name is Sarah Weaver. I'm a trombone player. Um, now, I know that moving from Greece to the United States changed your life dramatically. Um, did it also change your music that you composed? That's a very good question. Yes, to, to make it simple, absolutely. Anything that affects you and changes you as a human being will change how you do things, will change the way you perform, the way you improvise, the way you compose. I think it is very important that you grow as human beings beside, besides working on music. I think who you are will influence everything that you will do with your art. And that goes for whether you're a writer, whether you're a performer, 
uh, you make movies, you're a sculptor, or you write books, it doesn't really matter. Who you are affects everything you're going to create, everything you're going to do. We want to also welcome in our remote locations <laughs> once again. Sydney, okay. Australia, and we seem like we have an excited student there. Your name and your question for Yanni. Today, my name's Anthony Schmidt, and I'm 14 years old, and I go to conservatory in my high school. My question is, when you start a new composition, what are the first things you think of? When you start a new composition, what are the first, are the first things you think of? As he rocks, Yanni. <laughs> All right. I first know what a piece of music feels like. I know the emotional content of it. I know what it feels like. Then the choices of what sound I'm going to use, what rhythm I'm going to use, whether it's going to be a gentle piece or a fast piece, an energetic piece, it's going to begin with drums or it's going to begin with a single violin or a single note on the flute or so on, are very simple because you already know what it feels like. So you, at least you will know what you can't use and that helps. Next question. Stand up and your name again and your question. My name is Raina Zemmel and I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'm just wondering, is Yanni your first name or your last name? <laughs> my, my full name is Yanni Chrysomalis. Yanni is the first name, Chrysomalis is the last name. You, you made a great face. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I got tired of and uh, cut off the last name. And now I only have to spell the first one. <laughs> as I was reading the material on Yanni, that was my question as well. And I am so glad you asked that question indeed. As a matter of fact, we've got some people at the other locations who are ready to ask some questions of Yanni as well. And why not start at the nearest city in Detroit at the Martin Luther King High School? Go ahead. Identify yourself and what is your question? My name is Ken Cooper. I'm 16 years old and I sing in the Martin Luther King Concert Choir. My question for you today is what music do you enjoy playing the most? I like all music. There is no wrong music or right music or bad music or good music. It's, it's just music. We attribute qualities to it. Um, if you were to walk on, on a village on the Greek mountains, <laughs> and you were to hear what kind of music they play, certainly most of you will think it's cacophony. And it could be pretty irritating instead of beautiful. Nevertheless, those people absolutely love that. They get married to it. They die to it. They give birth to their children to it. They use it for all occasions and it works. Much like, as you saw earlier, the Australian man, the Aborigine, who used the didgeridoo. The Aborigines, this instrument, is used for everything. It's a religious instrument, a spiritual instrument. They are moved by it, they meditate with it. Is it wrong? Are we supposed to have judgment on them and say, no, this is not the way it's done? There's only one, one way to do it, and this is the way, our way. And I think this sort of attitude that we tend to have, which is our way is the best way and the only way, is very dangerous. And I also do not agree with it. I've traveled extensively all over the world, and that has taught me how to have an open mind. Certainly, I love what it is that I do. But it isn't the only thing that exists out there that I could like or love. An open mind. Have an open mind. That open mind that you're referencing, it had to come from someplace, and certainly not just when you became an adult. Who influenced you early on to be so receptive to all types of music? I was fortunate enough, my father and my mother, both of them, uh, were really very supportive and uh, essentially um, worked very hard to keep us from having judgments, harsh judgments. And 
there was a discrepancy between what I learned at home and what I learned in school. Unfortunately, I wasn't one of the lucky ones. I don't feel that I had great teachers at school. There was always a discrepancy between what the teachers were teaching me and what I was learning at home. I learned how to deal with it. It was frustrating at the time, but I also was taught at home that I have to have faith in myself, believe in myself, believe in what I feel. I think that's the only way you can do what it is that I am doing. I am taking a symphony orchestra and I'm putting microphones on violins. How dare you do that? I am changing the way things are done, uh, not because I'm trying to show off or, or be impressive or come up with something new, it's because I think it sounds good. It's something that attracts me. I want to try this. I want to see what, the, what happens when you put a didgeridoo with a symphony orchestra together. I, I could have a piece of music that uh, is strictly done for strings, and I could have harmonica in the middle of it. But you wouldn't even think about doing that if you were not coming at it from an open mind. We have a question in here. One piece of advice for Yanni before they venture out into the world, what would that be? It's the same advice I would give to anyone, whether you're a musician or any kind of career. <clears throat> you have to have faith in yourself. This is the first public appearance this year, and probably the only one, because I'm in the middle of writing an album right now. So I have been isolated for the last six months in the studio, and all I'm doing is writing and recording. My days are, I wake up, I play music, and I go to sleep. Then I wake up, and I work on music, and then I go to sleep. A lot of times, I won't eat, and people get worried about me because I drop a lot of weight. There's a lot of pleasure that can be derived from being creative, from expressing yourself. It, it, a lot of us are, that are creative, that do the job that we really like to do in the first place, we never get tired. You cannot work at a job for 16 hour days if you don't like the job. Within an hour or two you'll get fidgety, it'll be time to do something else and you'll try to do the best you can to get out of there. Any dream you may have, if you're passionate about it, you fuel that dream with passion, you cannot fail. That I promise you. Passion being the answer. In all these years, I've been searching for a clue and a way to lose weight, so I need to be creative <laughs> and not eat. <coughs> be passionate about it. Be passionate about it, okay? We've got more questions here, but before, let me swing across the Pacific. We've got a question for Yanni. Over in Hong Kong, please identify yourself and your question for Yanni. In today's, in today's modern, modern world of technology, technology how, do how do you make, make music, music human? human? Actually, that's, that's uh, something that anyone who gets involved with computers and keyboards and synthesizers has to be aware of. Uh, don't get buried in that technology. Technology is just a tool. Put it in its place. Don't let it take over your studio or whatever it is that you're going to be working with in the future. I think it's like a paintbrush or a better paintbrush that allows you to draw straighter lines or wider lines, easier. That's all it is. And you look at these modern keyboards and they do a myriads of things. There's a lot of knobs and electronic and all that stuff. It's good to spend a little time, learn it, and then put it aside. So when you need it, you can just reach and get it. But don't be overwhelmed by it. That's how you can lose the humanity. And obviously one of the things that I do, I avoid, avoid using the computers to create music. I want to make one more point about this. I use keyboards for one reason. They give us enormous capability for, for sound design, essentially. In the old days, if you wanted a new sound, you had to create a new instrument. Nowadays, electronically, you can reproduce or produce an enormous amount of sounds. Now, nothing can replace a real violin or a real cello or a real oboe. What we use as composers to create what we create is sound. That's the material that we use. Much like a sculptor would use a piece of marble or clay, or a painter would use their color and the brush. There's no difference. 
I tend to use the keyboards to add to what the orchestra cannot do. I added the drummer because I felt an orchestra could not quite have the rhythm that I wanted. I added a percussionist because there was a whole other world that opens up when you have drums and percussion. I added a bass player. So you can see if you just sort of open your mind a little bit, you experiment. And you just ask yourself what it is that you want. And then you begin trying to get that. You don't seem to do an awful lot dealing with, with pain, but yet you talk about your music being an expression of your life experiences. But why not pain? What do you try to communicate? I think it's, it's not as simple as, as saying I'm happy, I'm going to write a happy song, and I'm sad, I'm going to write a sad song. I, I take a little more time. I, I go one level past that point. I believe that anything that is painful or difficult or frustrating in your life, it's there for a reason. It's there to teach you. There are wonderful opportunities to learn. I, when I'm frustrated or I have a problem or I am encountering a painful situation, I do not write music about pain. I don't like to write about frustration. I wait until I tackle the problem, go through the pain, emerge on the other end, whether I succeeded in solving the problem or not, it does not matter. There is certain learning that has just taken place, and I have been changed by that situation. I speak in my music about the learning that took place. It's one more level removed from that. Examples of, of, of music, for example, like grunge or rap and so on, they express a lot of frustration and anger. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just people who have been faced with problems, they haven't been able to solve them, they're very frustrated and they're expressing that frustration. I just consciously choose not to do that. I don't think the world needs any more of that kind of art. My name is Megan Kelly, I'm from Woodhall, Illinois and I'm 15. I play the piano. First of all, I want to say you're so inspirational. But my question is, um, when I write music, sometimes I listen to songs I've already played for inspiration. What do you do? Do you listen to other music or does it, does it come as an emotional blast or how, do, how does it come for you? Yeah. It is an emotional blast when it comes out. If you're completely focused, you become the music. It comes out as a whole piece. Creativity is, is, is something that not, does not come from the outside, in my view. And when we say inspiration strikes, we're mi being misled. It's not coming from out there. It comes from inside. And it's just a matter of learning how to listen to it and how to tap into it. Now, everything we do in life is against that. It's we're busy, we have problems, we go to work, we pay insurance, put gas in the car, da da da. It's a lot of noise, a lot of pollution. We're, we're being bombarded every day with just a lot of noise. So it's really hard to hear what it is that we want to talk about. That's why isolation tends to help. You just got to block the input. You got to stop all this noise from coming in long enough to where you begin hearing yourself. Now all of a sudden your emotions are amplified. All of a sudden the notes on the piano have more meaning. They mean more. They have emotions in them. And if you sit quietly and you really, really, really focus, you're taken in by it. And all of a sudden, out comes this wonderful piece of music, and it surprises you how easy it was to come out. Two thousand students from 40 countries and every state in the Union make up Interlochen Camp for the Arts. Primarily known as one of the best musical schools in America, it is an extraordinary place to study all the arts. The philosophy of the school and the beauty of the surroundings nurture the creative spirit of the young artists, including one-on-one -on -one instruction.
Interlochen recognizes and encourages the importance of diversity in expression. Earlier in the day, Yanni had the opportunity to visit the campus and talk with some of the students. I'm seeing you tonight. Okay, well, I came to see you today, so you can see me tonight. Great. Right. Your creative process is truly amazing to me, but your transcription process, your hieroglyphic, what is this, and how in the world do you interpret it, Yanni? Well, that, again, that's uh, out of necessity. It's, it's not, it, it looks easy to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really anything, I think it looks more impressive than it actually is. It, it is a, essentially uh, notes, some numbers that uh, signify time signatures or length of notes, um, some symbols that I've decided that they mean a certain thing. For example, a little triangle over a note would mean that that is the highest note in that bar. Uh, essentially, this was made for me to remember something I already have been over in my mind, which brings me to the next point. Musical memory. Develop your memory. It's very important, particularly if you're going to be writing, creating, you need to be able to hold on to this information in your mind. I'd much rather juggle an entire piece of music in my mind, but that requires memory. So because at the beginning, when I started writing, I couldn't remember everything. I kept creating this shorthand, which over the years became more and more complicated, but it did a good job for me. Recently, in the last eight, ten years, I haven't had a lot of need for it because I trust whatever I think of with music never leaves my mind. And it's there. Right now, as we're speaking, I have seven pieces of music, including their orchestrations, which I trust when the time comes, which will be in a week from now, when I sit down with my transcriber, it will all be there. And it is all really just committed to memory. In the same section? Um, my name is Elizabeth Berkowitz, and I'm a musical theater major from Florida. And I would like to know, at any time in your life, did you ever feel left out and you wanted to play classical music or just fit in with all the other types of music, be one specific type of music? I want to answer this honestly. Um, I'm a pretty stubborn man. Uh, I'd like to say, yes, I felt left out, but I'm not sure that's the, that's the truth. I, kinda, I like working by myself. There was times to where I was frustrated because I was writing music for symphonies, for symphony orchestras, and there was no access to a symphony orchestra. So the next logical step was to use synthesizers. It's a cheap substitute, not a very good one, but at least it gave me a, a way of hearing what I was hearing in my mind for the first time. So in that sense, yes, I was, I always, I was left out because I couldn't get my hands on whatever I needed. Um, I am more of a creative entity than I am a performer. I find it very difficult to be repetitious. I find it very difficult to sit down and practice, and practice the same thing over and over again. I am much more interested in creating the next piece. And the way I cheat myself into practicing is I, in the, in, during the process to where I go through to teach my band and the orchestra how to play my music, I'm forced to play it too. So without realizing it, I'm practicing. Um, does that answer your question? You truly have been an active and involved audience as we had hoped. And Yanni has also been obviously dispersing uh, pearls of wisdom. Let's go down the road a bit to Detroit, Michigan. And let's hear a question from Martin Luther King High School. I would like to know what is your definition of new age music. Your definition of new age? Uh, <clears throat> well, new age music is not, the, the term new age is not a musical term. I think it's more of a term of, of convenience that uh, the record industry uh, decided to use to essentially uh, 
throw a bunch of music that they, they didn't know what to do with, that wasn't clear-cut rock and roll or jazz or classical. And particularly if you, you were using a synthesizer at the time, they decided that must be New Age. Unfortunately, New Age, the two words New Age, are a philosophical point of view on life. And when you apply that to music, you're bringing with it the baggage that goes with that philosophy. Now, I don't judge this philosophy. I've never studied it, so I don't really know exactly what it's all about. But I think it was an unfortunate choice of words to be applied to music. Another question here at Interlochen. I was wondering, what other, what other instruments do you play besides, like, piano and guitar? Uh, nothing else. That was it. The accordion, I played very well, but nobody <laughs> wants to... <laughs> Maybe tonight, before the night is out, somebody will come up with an accordion I get to play for you. Speaking of the accordion, uh, can you figure out what's wrong nah, with that? To, we have to pull back a little bit to see. Can we pull back a little more of that? Yeah, I probably am. 10 years old, 9 years old. That's a heavy accordion. You know what there they used to do? There it is, Yanni. They, I started playing it when I was 7 years old, and I would sit on a chair, and I, obviously I couldn't lift it. So they would put it on me. Yeah, they would put the accordion, and it would come up to here. And the problem with that was I couldn't get it off of me. So, th so they would leave it on me and leave me in the room by myself. <laughs> So then I had to practice whether I like to or not. We have a question over here. Okay, hello. My name is Lindsay White. I am from Elma, Michigan, and I'm a visual arts major. My question is, in all of the arts areas, whether it be visual arts or music, um, many artists seem to stick to one particular thing. Like, you don't see very many painters, for instance, doing a lot of sculpture or many country music artists doing a lot of classical. What is it that has driven you to, when you perform, do so many different aspects of the music industry? Um, if you think back of Michelangelo, he was a sculptor and a painter. I, I think, um, I remember Einstein, uh, towards the latter part of his life, he was learning how to play the violin. I think it's no, I don't think it's very good to just be doing one thing only. I think if you're going to be using your art, whatever your art is, it doesn't really matter. Most of the things that I said about music, with the exception of the specifics of recording and um, you know, orchestration and so on, I believe hold true for any art form. Any art form is essentially you're expressing your inner self. That's all you're doing. And if there's nothing inside, what are you going to put on your painting? What are you going to put in the book? It's as if you know every word in the English dictionary for in any particular language. And you know the syntax and the form. That does not make you Shakespeare. It's what you're going to say while you put these beautiful words together that's important. As in the music, I believe, the most powerful aspect of music is the message in it. Try to learn as much as you can of anything. I began as an athlete. I was a swimmer. I was at the national team of Greece. No one would have thought I would have been anything else but a swimmer. But then I came to the United States at 18 and I studied psychology. How different. Then I decided to, after I graduated, to get into music. All these three subjects seem unrelated. Not so. They're extremely related. From swimming and athletics, I learned perseverance. I learned that you can be more powerful than your body. You can overcome your pain. You can discipline yourself. And that I'm going to have as a weapon for the rest of my life. I know I can control myself. That's very important. From psychology, I understood myself. And through that, I began understanding other people around me. That also helped me become more introspective, which I need nowadays. And, and you need a deeper understanding about life. As, as I understand life at, at different levels, um, then I can use music to express what those levels feel like. If I was not aware of the existence of these levels, how would I make music to describe them in the first place? You can't lie with it. You can't fake your way through art. The public may not quite understand what is wrong, 
but they do know if they like it or they don't like it. Um, so the suggestion is work at anything. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's new. And if you find yourself repeating and repeating and repeating, then get out of it. Do something else. You're young enough right now to where no matter what you do, it would be very important for your future. Because most of the things you're going to encounter in your lives will be new. There's so much more for you to learn. So don't, do not lock into one thing yet. We have a question here, inside. Hello, I'm Neil Bacon from New York City, New York. My question is, do you ever have a uh, role model as a child? And do you think it's important for a kid to have a role model? growing up? Yes, I had quite a lot of role models and there was a lot of people I admired. However, I was inspired enormously by the ancient Greek philosophers, which I still study, uh, by great artists or anyone who cared to, to do something that was extraordinary, like Michelangelo, Da Vinci, um, Einstein, uh, I'm inspired very much not only by musicians. I don't look at musicians to, to be inspired by it. It isn't as if I'm going to listen to a Beethoven piece and say, that was pretty nice, I should do something just like that one. That could, couldn't be farther from the truth. Anyone that impresses me or moves me or, or anyone who has accomplished something that's extraordinary, something particularly that could not be done, that inspires me because it points in one direction, which is nothing is impossible. Everything is possible. We have a question near center stage right in front of Yanni. My name is Kelsey and um, I take harp and also um, chorus. Um, my question is that you talk it, talked a lot about liking music and writing and stuff, but what else do you like to do besides composing and playing music? I love anything that has to do with the ocean. I grew up uh, a, in Kalamata, like I told you earlier, it's a beautiful uh, little town in Greece, southern Greece. It's right, my house is right next to the water. So I like uh, windsurfing and scuba diving and um, sailing. I used to race sailboats. I like anything that has to do with the ocean. And now I also like pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Question here. Hey Annie, how's it going? Hi, how are you? I'm good, all right. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm Ann Stacy, and I'm from Dearborn, Michigan, and I play the violin. The lady in red who plays the violin with you in, in your concerts and that, who is she, and do you have any other friends that, that work with you, like that you associate with or anything? Do I have any other friends? Yeah. It, 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 no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't, don't take that personally. I meant, like, do you have any friends that you associate with in your orchestra or, like, like the lady in Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't say enough about the lady in red, as if most people refer to her. Her name is Karen Briggs. And uh, I found her about six years ago, seven years ago. She, she was a diamond in the raw, I could tell. Very original. Didn't quite fit in in any groove. She's very jazz oriented, but she had the classical training and classical background. Um, she took, um, I worked with her on the Middle Eastern scales at the same time, and uh, I could tell she has her own sound. She's, she's very powerful. So when she does solos, it's just you feel this enormous energy, this fire in this woman. And I adore her. We have become very close friends. I think of her as my sister anyway. Um, and to answer your, the, re the rest of your question, yes, most of the people in the band are very close friends and I spend quite a lot of my time and expend quite a lot of energy being their cheerleader, essentially. I work with all of them. I try to encourage them. I try to create an atmosphere in which they can grow. And the result is um, live when we perform, the orchestra and the band are one. The orchestra is not an afterthought. I did not write the music for the band and then we brought the orchestra in. This is all, I look at the whole orchestra as one piece. 
And so, yes, I have quite a lot of friends there, which is very nice. It is really quite nice as we get set for this question over here to see that Yanni has this calming influence on the audience. Early on, it was Mr. Yanni. Now it is, yo, Yanni. <laughs> yo. <laughs> There's a young lady who's been very patient over here, stage right. My name is Karen Majewski, and I'm a piano major from Tampa, New Jersey. And I wanted to know if you think that artists can be created or if they have to be born like with the right brain structure or something? That's a very good question. <clears throat> and it's also a very difficult question. And in psychology, the, uh, the influence of the environment versus genetics is, is a very old question and it's debated heavily. And I don't think they have the answer yet, but I can give you what I think and what I'm imagining or what I'm suspecting is taking place. Um, I think that you were born with a predisposition I don't think I was born to love music, if I look at myself. I was not born with perfect pitch. And a lot of people say, well, that's a gift. No, it's not a gift. That's an easy way to dismiss something that maybe you don't understand. Um, I developed perfect pitch because I worked at it. Now, what made me want to learn music? That's what we have to look at. Where I grew up, my father played the guitar at nights and my mom sang, and, and in Greece, uh, it's customary to have a little wine, or a lot of wine, <laughs> during dinner. And so after dinner, uh, my uncle and my cousins and so on, the family get together uh, at least once or twice a week. Uh, my dad would play the guitar and everybody would sit around the table and sing. So music was very important. I watched my father play the guitar and I was very impressed. I wanted to do the same thing. I watched how passionate my mom was when she was singing. And I think that developed my interest in music. And I think something happens to you during your life that for some reason something clicks at a certain moment in time that just focuses your attention. And at that moment on you become a sponge. You're a special filter that captures music. Somebody talks to you about movies, it goes right through your brain. Somebody talks to you about music, it gets caught. And it gets caught. Years and years and years, and all of a sudden everybody says, boy, you're so talented. That must have been a gift. I don't believe it was a gift. I worked very hard for it. I know how hard I have worked for it. And then we're going to travel all the way up toward the back of the auditorium. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rebecca Lavitan, and I'm a viola major. And I would like to know if music is the most important thing in your life. Oh. oh. <laughs> if it doesn't, it's pretty close. <laughs> it's, uh, I know one thing. It has been one of the best friends I ever had. And he has been one of the most faithful friends I've ever had. And that's the other thing I, I can tell you. That no matter what you're studying, no matter what your art is, that is the one thing that will never betray you. And the more time you put in it, the more faithful it will be to you, and the more it will give you back. You never lose for putting energy into whatever it is that you love. So, again, I, I can't certainly say that this is the most important thing in my life because anything that teaches me is extremely important, too. My personal growth is very important. It's my passion. It's my love. And it's pretty close up there at the top. And we're doing our best to see if we can continue to work all sides of the room here, front and back as well. We have a question here. Hi, I'm Alexis Kasuki. I play violin. Um, I was wondering if you didn't choose music as your career, what other interests would you have pursued? It's hard to have an answer for that one, because it's an if, if, if. It's hard to say what I would do. I know one thing, though. I would only do what I loved. I would never, ever compromise that. If I did not like something, I wasn't going to get involved in it. And I, that, again, I was very, is something that I would never compromise. I think it's torment 
to spend a lifetime, 35, 40 years, doing a job that you really don't like to do, which is, by the way, an enormous amount of the population nowadays is precisely in this situation. It's, you guys still got a chance. You, you should try very hard to do the thing that you love the most. Then you'll be happy. And it isn't important whether you make millions of dollars or you become famous or you're known all over the world. I think that would be a great dream and it may materialize, it may not. However, the trip to becoming famous is more important than being famous. I think the journey is more important than reaching your destination or your goal, whatever it is. If I was not, not happy from 20 years old when I decided to go into music until 38 when I finally got a reasonably good break, what good is it if I'm happy now? I just spent 18 years being miserable. I would have lost my life. Understand? As we get set to close, I think it's only appropriate to have Yanni maybe share with us a closing thought. I know we've had a wide-ranging discussion touching upon all areas of your life and your influence, but if there was a summation that you'd want to give to the students, what would that be? Well, I've talked about most of the things that I wanted to say to you. I, it has been wonderful for me, at least, to be able to speak to you. And what I hope for is that some of the thoughts that I gave you will, will help you in, in, in your future. Um, as you might have suspected, I want to open your minds. You may have seen me again trying to tell you there is no right way or wrong way to do music and so on. Try to open your minds to try different styles. Listen. At least if you don't want to play it, listen to it. Be exposed to it, at least. It will give you colors. I think um, learning the classics and learning the ways that people did music in the past is a very good thing. I think there's a lot of knowledge that, that you can derive from it. And it's worth taking the time and really studying it. But it is, after you finish studying it, it's what you have to add to what's already there that makes you who you are. When you create, you'll become more than the sum of your parts. Whatever you hear, whatever you see, whatever someone tells you, again, it's not yours. There's going to come a time in your life to where you're going to have to bring something to the table that wasn't there until you stepped up. Whether you're a painter, a sculptor, a writer, a musician, whatever it is that you do, at some point, you will have to speak with your own voice. So, as your teachers teach you, my suggestion is work with them and try to make the knowledge they give you yours. Own it and move on from there. Try to, try to take a step on your own. So what if you trip? So what if it doesn't work? Try it. The creative process is a wonderful one and it's going to be a great friend to you. Um, I think I've said everything I want to say. Uh, uh, again, thank you for having me. It's been a real thrill and a pleasure and I hope I come back again. <laughs>